right, terrific. Welcome back. I am mic'd and then a little bit more. Okay. Um, we get to kick things off now with our panel discussion on smart cities in a world of ubiquitous computing or pervasive computing, uh, as uh, IBM would say it. And I'm just going to start things out by introducing our panel moderator, and then she'll take it from there. So our moderator, Maria Saporta, is uh, well known to many here at Georgia Tech and to the Atlanta area. She's our other native Atlantan on our program today. She uh, works now with the Atlanta Business Chronicle, writing her weekly column and news stories, as well as her own website, the uh, supporterreport.com. Um, that follows 27 years uh, with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, um, where she was a business and civic columnist. Um, so she has been engaged in many, many of the topics that we were discussing uh, with Kwanzaa Hall and with our opening plenaries. Um, we've got another 100. She uh, was named uh, by Georgia Trends uh, one of the 100 most influential Georgians in 2000 and 2001 and has continued on that list as a notable Georgian in 2002, 2003, 4, 5, 10, 11, and 12. Don't mess with this woman. She knows what's going on, and this panel is in very capable hands. So thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Um, this is a personal preference of mine, but um, I hate... I love people who are closer in so we can feel more like intimate. So for those of y'all who are way far away and I can't see your expressions, I know, hi, way down there. If y'all don't mind and, and aren't scared of me, I promise not to spit on y'all or anything. If you, if you wouldn't mind moving up a little bit um, so that we can make this more of a conversational and intimate deal. Aha. One person. I, I made, I affected change. Thank you, thank you. Two people. Okay, let's start a movement. Takes two, three, all right, three. All right, okay. Yeah, it just makes it better um, because then we feel like we're not talking at you, but with you. How's that? Okay, y'all want to be part of this, right? Um, and in that note, uh, I wanted to have this very distinguished panel uh, introduce themselves to you and give you a little bit about who they are. And, uh, aha, see, now the first woman. It takes women a little while to, to, get, to get brave enough to come to the very front. But thank you. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, you... For you, well, why don't you move on down? Yeah, come on. We, we're, we're friendly down here. See, I'm from the South. I'm from Atlanta. Y'all just come back. Come on. Um, okay, so I would like to have our panel uh, introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about uh, who they are, what they do, and how they impact this conversation that we're having, and then I'll ask them some specific, maybe a little bit more personal questions about so we can get to really know them. So um, if we can car start with Stephen on my far left. Uh, Stephen, yeah, Mr. So at and uh, You're not from around here, are you? Uh, you noticed the answer. Uh, yeah, there. okay, go ahead. <laughs> tell, tell us, Stephen Vincent. So let me, uh, let me just give a, a brief introduction to myself. So I'm Stephen Vincent. I'm uh, responsible for strategy, product, and business development for at and and their digital life uh, product set. And the digital life product set is all about home security, home automation, and it's really starting to bring things together for people in a meaningful manner. Um, that organization is here based in Atlanta. Um, so that's where I live, work, literally walk down here a couple of blocks to, to come and be on this panel this afternoon. Uh, and now our organization is part of a bigger part of AT&T that's working on connected car initiatives uh, and connected literally anything. The Internet of Things is the kind of the buzzword that gets thrown around too much. So in terms of going through this panel, the discussion this afternoon, I mean, obviously there's a, a number of challenges that, that present us all um, in terms of how do we bring all of the pieces of the puzzle together in a, in a manner that's meaningful to, to people and end users and citizens on the ground. So that's, that's the aim today, to try and talk a little bit about how do we, how do we marry some of these things that we're doing in the, in the private sector with some of the initiatives that are being done at the community level. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Carl DiSalvo. I'm an associate professor in the digital media program here at Georgia Tech. And I study the ways that communities use technologies and the ways that we can involve communities in the design of emerging technologies. 
And in particular, um, we're interested in the ways in which community members can be understood as innovators and how they can contribute to the development of technologies that serve their civic ends. So um, we do that here at Georgia Tech. And then on a larger scale, I'm also the co-director for the Intel Science and Technology Center for Social Computing, which is a five-institution consortium. And one of the strands within that, in particular, is looking at the ways in which social computing, and by which we mean not just Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, but the ways in which computing actually becomes a social activity, how that, how that happens in civic space. So for example, we have a strand looking at how do we think about IoT, which we've usually thought of in terms of an industry type platform, how do we think about civic IoT? What would it mean to have um, IoT embedded in a community? What would it mean to have community members who are using those technologies for their own given civic ends? Okay, Jeremy. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Jeremy Dyes, and I work at IBM on the Smarter Cities team. I lead a team of folks in, uh, who work with cities across North America, you know, addressing some of these very challenges on how data can help inform public policy and improve citizen engagement. Um, there are a couple of areas that I'm particularly passionate about, and one of those, and, and this phrase did scare me at first, but I've come around on it, but it's the concept of a citizen as a censor. Um, a citizen what? As a censor. And if you take away the sort of Orwellian overtone of that for a moment, um, the fact that we have um, citizens who are seeking to engage with their government and vice versa, and we have platforms now for that to happen that simply weren't available um, in, until very recently. So I think that's a fascinating um, thing to explore. The second thing that I, I am really passionate about is looking at cities um, as systems of systems. That's a very famous expression to describe cities. And I am particularly interested in understanding where those systems interconnect and the touch points of those various systems. So how policies in public transportation, for example, might impact education outcomes um, or public safety outcomes. So understanding exactly where and when those different systems touch each other, um, how you can understand uh, what to expect um, when they do touch each other, I think those are really fascinating and, and very challenging problems to solve. Okay, Jennifer? So I'm Jennifer Clark, um, and it's good I'm sitting next to Jeremy because I am a professor of uh, public policy here at Georgia Tech. Um, and the area that I study is, um, I study the spatial distribution of uh, economic activity. But I'm an economic geographer. And as a consequence, uh, cities are very important in my research because a lot of economic activity concentrates in cities. Um, I'm also here at Georgia Tech, the uh, director of the Center for Urban Innovation, which is a new um, interdisciplinary research center here on campus. And what we do there is we look at uh, urban innovations and their diffusion. And I should say that in particular, we're looking at institutional innovations, governance innovations, but also um, how some of these technologies like civic innovations, social and civic computing actually play out in uh, the built environment. Okay, well, as I promised, I want to know a little bit more about you. Um, where did each of you grow up? And again, we'll start. Um, and it, tell us a little bit about your home life. Was it in the suburbs? Was it in an apartment? Um, you know, was it in the center of a city or, or what? And if you were to describe in your mind of where you would want to live, what would be the smart city for you to live in? And you can either name a city or describe it. What would that be? Um, Stephen, I'll start with you. Um, you know, I detect a British accent, is it? Um, but anyway. Yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll give you that. It's either Britain or it's Florida these days. So, <laughs> so I, I, was, uh, I was born and raised uh, just north of London, so I was literally out in the sticks, out in the boonies, I guess, is the, the correct, word of, correct way of phrasing it. Um, lived in rural Britain, rural England in the countryside, very picturesque, just like you see on all the TV shows and all the, <laughs> all the uh, films. It's just, you know, cobblestone streets and, uh, and people walking around with flat caps and the rest of it. So it was very, uh, very rural. Um, now, on the other hand, though, what I, what I did do is we were about 20, 30 miles north of London, um, which was great because it meant every school field trip, every birthday treat, everything else was all about going and catching the train and going and riding down into London. 
Um, and so when I start to think about um, jumping forward to, to where I live now, I mean, one of the, ironically, I live on the end of the Marta Line, um, on the north end of the Marta Line. So, oh, so I think... Which one? There are two north ends. I live on the north, north end. Uh, Sandy <laughs> Springs, Dunwoody. I'm sorry? Sandy Springs, Dunwoody. Okay. And I think somewhat there must be some of that... Um, that nature nurture rearing thing that made me choose to be on the end of a rail line so that I could ride into the city. And so when I start thinking about um, where do I where do I bring or what do I bring from a from a historical perspective, I, I'm uh, a user of public transport. Um, I chose to, to live on the end of the subway line um, here in the in the U.S. So I think something that has uh, a uh, a city that has a, an infrastructure and a capability. And I like the comment earlier about uh, when we were talking on, in the previous session about how I want a shuttle bus that actually goes from somewhere I want to go from somewhere else I want to go. I think that would be my, my, one of some of my first wishes. For, Your for own smart. shuttle bus, though. My, uh, well, <laughs> I, think that's the, I think that's where I, I would look to, trying to get the right infrastructure in place and, and making it accessible to people. Um, and that's probably partly just due to my background and my history. Where and that's a transportation issue. In terms of communications, uh, television, uh, BBC, I'm, what, there are three channels or whatever we've always heard in, in England, or uh, tele, I mean. I, 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 so, so I will go back, when I, when I was, when I was raised, um, I was ra when, I, when I was first born, I think there were, there were just about three TV channels in the UK. Um, I can remember Channel 4 coming online and that being a, a big event, and I can remember even Channel 5 coming online somewhat later in my childhood. Um, then I can remember satellite TV, but I, I never had satellite TV, so uh, I, I never saw more than, than what ultimately became digital terrestrial. So, so big I think, data for you was four stations. I think I can cope with more than and I think I probably only ever watched four at, at this point in time here in this country. So okay. I think I think... We're somewhat overblessed with the amount of media and, and disinformation that we can get in some of these, these in some of these channels today. Okay, Carl. Uh, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, on the edge of the city, um, right inside the city, but not in the city center. Not. And uh, I, I don't think I realized till later how formative it was to grow up in a city that is part of the Rust Belt. And um, I've lived in other Rust Belt cities as well, but there's something about growing up in a city that's still marked by manufacturing. So for those of you who haven't been to Cincinnati, one of the interesting things is it still has operational factories inside the city limits. And so as you drive through the city and the highway goes through the city like it does here, you pass, for example, GE. And there's something about having this city that industry was still very present. Um, and I remember later after Cincinnati, I actually moved to um, Minneapolis and being very confused driving outside of the city and not seeing factories. Right? It's like, where's the stuff get made? Um, and so I think there was something special about growing up in a Rust Belt city and that set the tone. I'm trying to think if I have a favorite city that I could Play off of to say what would be the kind of city we wanted to live in? Is that the question? Yeah, or for you, what does smart city, if you were to envision that smart city, could you either describe it or say, aha? I mean, Jeremy and I were talking, you know, he asked favorite city. He had lived in Paris when he was 14. You know, that to him, even though he remembered some negative things about Paris at that point in time. But, uh, <laughs> this is all good. Okay. Yeah. No, it's all good. <laughs> um, I lived in Minneapolis-St. Paul for almost a decade. Uh -huh. And to me, that's a great example of a smart city. That's a city in which people have adapted to really harsh environments and made living there not just bearable, but pleasant. And it's also a city that is easy to get around and for which the public spaces are used in really um, special ways, right? The public spaces, there's an active public sphere, public life that happens in those cities that's really remarkable. And um, the, the citizens, the residents, the people who work there really take ownership um, of that city and make great use of it, so. I think it's got the second highest per capita use of bicycle um, transportation of any other city in the country year round. I mean, it's which they're crazy. Um, but anyway, yeah. 
adapting to harsh environments, I guess. It's yeah, and making it enjoyable to live there. Like yeah. saying, what does the city offer us? And how can we how can we find pleasure in it? Okay, Jeremy. Great. Um, I grew up in a in a suburb of New York City, and it wasn't rural by any stretch, but it was very suburban. Um, and as was mentioned, I had the good fortune to go move to a city when I was 14. And being in an apartment, um, and, you know, with, without a car, that was all very new to me, and it was it was it was awesome. So breaking news: living in Paris is pretty great. <laughs> um, but it, it really did inform, I think, where I wanted to live going forward. And I've spent the next you know two decades, you know, living in, in various cities. Um, had my second child, and in a, about a year ago, moved out of. of Boston, which is where I, I li I've lived, and I was surprised how much living in a city and wanting to maintain a lot of that lifestyle informed my decision making for trying to find a home. Uh, it was very important to us to be able to walk to the train to get back into the city from a commute perspective, but also access to the, the cultural attributes of the city, um, and to be able to have an anchor point that we could walk to. So this, this idea of a walking lifestyle was really important to us, and, and I think that when I think about um, my idealized vision of a smart city, I think about density, uh, and I think about the ability to um, be able to walk places, because I think that does foster some sort of spontaneous interaction that leads to a lot of creativity and, and innovation. Were you all able to find that, sp that spot? It was hard. It took some time. Um, we live about seven miles outside the city now, but we are uh, you know, less than a five-minute walk to, it's certainly not Boston, but six or eight great restaurants and dry cleaners and a train to the city and all of that. So it's it's an interesting compromise. Um, do, do you live near uh, Stephen and Sand <laughs> Sand Springs? I, I live outside Boston. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, oh, you're not in Atlanta. I'm not in Atlanta. No, no I'm, Atlanta. I'm, I'm a you're grateful still visitor Boston. today. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. I got you. Um, but it's, yeah, so it was, it was difficult. It was hard. Um, but it, uh, I think it was a, a good compromise. And it forced me to think about how cities mm -hmm. often extend beyond their borders. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jennifer? So since people are saying Boston, I feel obligated to say I grew up in Somerville, uh -huh. uh, San Antonio, and Seoul, and moving back Seoul, in, so like Seoul, Korea. South Korea, and okay. moving back and forth between uh, San Antonio and Seoul. Um, San Antonio is the only place that I lived in a single family home, so mm -hmm. I've been a, I was raised as a city person the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of cities that I, I really like, um, I'm really enjoying Atlanta right now. I've been here nine, nine and a half years, and it took me a, I don't know. It's something that... It, it, it feels like um, I'm just now starting to find what's great about Atlanta. But um, this, the city that I probably enjoy the most is, uh, is D.C., and it's, uh, it's, I think my excuse for that is I am a public policy professor, so <laughs> <laughs> I should be able to get away with that. Um, it was it, interesting, too, that I, I think that so, so many of these cities have um, pockets that are so common to each other. I was actually at, um, nobody laugh at this one, but I was at Whole Foods on Sunday, like half of you probably were, and uh, I, uh, from across the checkout, one of my uh, high school friends from Seoul was there as well, and it turns out she's moved into exactly the same neighborhood. So I have a new, new old friend, but part of this is that this idea that we, we, the global local piece that I think that really ties us together. And I will, I will just finish this little anecdote with, this is another friend who, the last time I lived in D.C., we ran into each other on the street when we both lived in D.C. So it's just one of those things where we're not doing a good job of keeping in touch, clearly. But <laughs> it doesn't matter because the universe is, keeps bringing us back together because of that global local connection that we have. We end up in the same place. Well, when we talk about what is going on in cities now, and, and, and I know you looking at it from a commercial standpoint, uh, you know, at and how does this make sense from a market and consumer-driven way? And, and Carl, you're concerned about where does a citizen and the civic and the resident fit in? And, um, you know, I think, Jeremy, I don't know where you would fit in into that equation um, because I know IBM's um, Smart Cities initiatives has tried to really help it be how do we make better cities um, 
and make that smarter, and from a public policy, that there are certain economic implications for the kind of cities we're, we're creating. Um, we're, clearly cities are changing. More, more people are moving to cities. They're densifying. Um, there's more pressure being put on our governments to adapt. So where, how can we create the kind of uh, cities that technology works for everyone? Why don't, why don't we start with that? And, and Carl, I'm going to throw that one to you because you're concerned that there's not a quote-unquote citizen representative on the panel. Um, if, we, if we are moving to this big data world, um, where, how can we make sure that the this technology is there on a, on a democratic basis, democratic small d. Um, okay, so I teach design classes. That's one of the things I do here. And to me, this ends up being um, a design problem. So I think with, if we look at the way that design is practiced now and has been practiced um, for several decades, there's a lot of focus on what people refer to as um, human-centered or user-centered design, which is this notion of like, okay, I'm going to have this product or service, and there's a user at the end of it, and I need to take her or him into account in its design. And I think on the one hand, that, that was a good thing. But I think that when it comes to designing for cities, we have to, we have to begin to think and say, it's not just a user, right? That's, it, it's actually... It's a citizen, and that has certain meanings, and we need to ask ourselves, what do we mean um, by a citizen? So maybe we need to switch and think about what is a citizen-centric design um, when we're thinking about cities. It's a resident, right? Um, so it's a person who lives in a neighborhood or works in a neighborhood or plays in a neighborhood or worships in a neighborhood or does whatever they do. And it's those aspects of our civic life that I think need to come to the forefront in our design processes um, to allow us to create the kinds of cities that we want to create. And it's completely doable. And I'm not even sure that it's hard, but it's a matter of making that choice to say, what are cities about? Are cities about a notion of civics? Okay, if we, if we agree that that's the case, then how do we bring that forward and have questions about civics leading our design decisions Questions about democracy. What do we mean by democracy? Um, leading our design decisions as we develop these technologies and services. Any response? And I'm, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, it's, I think it's a um, very interesting perspective. You know, I think one of the things that we talk a lot about as a, and we are a technology company, right? So we, we have a unique perspective here. Unique being a, a kind word, an optimistic word. Um, but we talk a lot about this, this concept of, of data as a natural resource and viewing data like you would view a natural resource, um, in that, A, there's value in it, right? So there's value in, in diffusing it. But I think it's important that the government plays a role in brokering that resource, just as governments play a role in brokering water, natural gas, um, other natural resources. You have to understand where it's coming from. You have to ensure that it's protected. Uh, and then you have to um, create a mechanism through which the citizens can interact with it, benefit from it, and engage with it. So while they may not control the content from, um, from beginning to end, and nor should they, but I, I do believe the government has an important role in, in being able to diffuse data to all different parts of the community. And Stephen, from a corporate standpoint, how does that strike you? I mean, I, it, I've gone to, I've been covering community meetings longer than I would want to admit to any of you young, young folks in the crowd, consensus is not something I've ever seen in a community uh, meeting or a civic group. And the idea of, of citizens uh, leading. Anyway. Uh, so any thoughts you have? So, uh, so I think, I think, I think um, at a very high level, I'm, I'm agreeing with the principles, but I think uh -huh. the, the challenge that we always have is that how do we make people aware of, of the resource, the natural resources it's just been put, that they are themselves inherently generating? Um, how, how do we educate people in general as to, as to the, the potential value for that, of that resource? 
Because I think at, at this point in time, we're, we're starting to see a, should we say, a, a number of small ecosystems that are popping up, some that are centered around the, the mobile device that's in your pocket, some that's centered around devices that you might wear on your wrist to, to measure your health. Um, do the ecosystems that are centered around the car, what's going on, driving habits. We see, we see flow on TV with a, a plug it in and I'll, I'll monitor your driving habits and I'll give, you a, uh, I'll give you a discount based on your driving habits. We see all of these things starting to come together in, in certain uh, more advanced pilot cities where you start linking uh, driving and spaces and, and metering and and tolls on the road, all of these things are starting to come together and, and, and it is generating an awful lot of uh, natural resource or, or data, this, this big data, I'm going to use the buzzword. Um, the challenge says is that some of these are coming and are being generated in a, in a, in a shall we say, a, a private arrangement between an individual and a, a company that's providing a, a some kind of service. Um, clearly as we go into, into an AT&T are very respectful of people's data and their privacy, we have a, a very much a a closed ecosystem, we don't share and leverage our customers' data. Um, but then you have companies on the other side of the, of the, of the other end of the spectrum who, whose entire business model is based on um, sharing and leveraging that data. And so somewhere you have to find a medium of bringing together um, public projects, private projects that are often based on significant investments in infrastructure to, to get them up and running and generally bring this awareness up to the, the population as to the potential value of this resource and, and how then do you, do you go about regulating it or controlling it? I think that's a, that's a big question and I don't know that there's a, an easy or obvious answer. Sounds like a time to ask the public policy guru <laughs> to come in and uh, <laughs> see how you... Well, I was at a research meeting recently, and uh, we were talking about uh, adoption of some of these uh, more greener, innovative infrastructures. And um, you know, we, we were kicking around, you know, the research design for this, and somebody said, let's do a willingness to pay survey, find out how much people will pay for um, uh, transit-oriented development. And somebody else in the room said, but yes, but people don't buy infrastructure. And I thought this is this is actually really important part of this story is that when we're talking about consumers, right, who are buying, a, who are users of a, a specific uh, end product, then it's a different calculus than if what we're talking about institutional infrastructure, layers and layers of private and public governance institutions that actually make the decisions about what gets uh, it ultimately invested in and when you know, and how much and how incrementally. And it does change the research designs uh, substantially because if we're talking about smart cities and we're talking about hard infrastructure, <laughs> we've got a lot of stakeholders to engage in the discussion. Well, we did a very good job building stupid cities, <laughs> didn't we? I mean, and there was I a lot of think, infrastructure built. I, so I, so I, I, I mean, it, uh, ugly as some of the infrastructure is, I think this, yeah. is, this is one of the yeah. things that we miss sometimes is that um, – uh, Cities are fairly smart on their own. They're amazing ecosystems. People uh, negotiate their ways through sometimes very dumbly deployed cities, but in very smart, innovative ways every day. And any time we intervene in that system, we have to think uh, quite, um, quite long and hard about whether our interventions are actually going to have generate externalities we, we just don't see coming because we're enamored with the technology and not appreciating enough what actually people are negotiating on the ground, which goes back to the previous points about having this discussion with whether there's citizens or users or residents, whoever they are, they need to be part of the discussion. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, Jennifer, you said something this morning, if I can repeat something you said this morning, which is actually that cities, cities already are pretty smart. I mean, city, city, and, I, and I thought that was a great comment. Like, um, and, and, and I'll give you an example, an example that I've been sort of looking at casually from a research perspective that other people have done more research on. But if you look at, if you look at New York City's response to Hurricane Sandy, and the Department of Homeland Security has published a report on this called the Resilient Social Network, which is really great. It's freely available. One of the things that they point out is that there was a citizen-led response to the shortcomings of providing aid in the wake of Hurricane Sandy that was nothing short of amazing, in which you had 
citizens who were making use of technology platforms and essentially gaming them, right? Like using wedding registries and Amazon gift cards and other sorts of things as a way of like moving materials and, and, surplus, and, and, and supplies around um, and producing their own signage within the city. So de actually developing their own signage to point residents to places in which um, aid was being provided. And I think this is an amazing example of the kind of hybrid <laughs> systems that in the best cases will emerge, right? in which, yeah, you still have government services and systems there without a doubt. Like, you need those there. You still have corporate systems and services there. Um, but there's also affordances in them that allow us to manipulate them, to use them in our times of need or the way that we want to, um, to meet what we want to do. So, I mean, I agree. Like, you need, you need to have government involved in these or, or something like governance involved in sort of distribution of resources, I think the opportunity we have is to say, how do we want to innovate that, right? Like, are there models we can cut from things like participatory budgeting, which we have a student in the audience who's studying, and say, oh, can you take models like that and apply them to data, right? Maybe that's the way to go. So I think, I think we have this great, we're at this moment where we can say, we don't have to replicate the existing structures. We can at least explore and experiment with what other structures might be. Can you live in a city today without a smartphone? Sure. Your experience will be very, very different than um, I think what a lot of us are used to. I mean, it, um, you know, like I said, I live in Boston, and, and we have an, a, a city-provided app where we could take pictures of potholes and, and send them into the city. Um, the people who collect garbage in Boston drive is around. Is that a citizen-led? Uh, so this is a really interesting point. Yeah. So I think... One of the things that Boston did, and again, I'm being a little bit provincial here, sorry, yeah. hyping up my city. Um, one of the things that Boston did that I think was really great was that they created an office of innovation that they call the Office of New Urban Mechanics, um, specifically to foster projects like this to figure out how to get citizens more engaged and how to use data more effectively. They realized very early on that the existing city governance structures, um, mayor's offices, council, et cetera, weren't really set up that way. And I think um, Councilman Hall really, what a lucky, you guys are incredibly lucky to have a partner like that. And he's not here, so I'm, you can't accuse me of kissing up to him. Well, Jay's here. Oh, okay, Jay, I'm so super <laughs> Well, I, you know, it, it, it's remarkable Jay's to have someone. Jay's tweeting already. Good, excellent, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, I'm saying nice things because I mean them then. I didn't know you were here. Uh, because you have a partner who's willing to sort of invest in that, in that incubation period. Um, and, and this group in Boston has done some really, like, crazy things. Like, for example, they gave smartphones to the people who collect trash and recycling and, and put an app on it that senses the vibrations in the streets. To, and they use that data to gauge road conditions in the street. So these people are driving around the neighborhoods already, police officers, et cetera. And now you're using them as an ability to be able to get data that you didn't have before. Um, so you, you, I think, but getting back to your point, so I think you know, those of us who have those types of, of technologies, we can um, experience this in a different way. But I think for the foreseeable future, you can't assume that that is a gateway to being a, or, or an active participant in the city, that you have to have access to that type of technology or else you'll lose whole neighborhoods that I talked about earlier. Well, I guess that's my question. Are we creating, um, you know, the haves and the have-nots? Uh, are we creating a society that you almost have to have access to, whether it's the Internet, big data, whatever, to live a certain lifestyle, and those who do not either have the means or the ability or the access to having whatever devices are to to be able to access that are, are going to be left out, are going to be somehow without. And, and how smart is it to have cities that would, that would have that two-tiered? And we, I mean, I guess since the history of cities, you've always had citizens who are, you know, not as uh, well off as other citizens, but just, have we just created another level of inequity? I mean, this is this is really difficult, and this and the three one one systems are um, the, the, the which is how to help the city or how to 
provide feedback as a as right. A so if you think about um, if if you visit with people in Atlanta, that when people see uh, there are people who just call City Hall and say there is a pet pothole. That's what they've done for 40 years is they call and report a pothole. They know how to report a pothole. They don't need an app. So the, for them, when you start thinking about a 311 system, they think, you know, what is this, who is this for, my grandchildren? You know, they, they, it's not their thing, and it's not going to be their thing. And I think there's this, this question of, you know, as much as it, this transition to this different kinds of technology, 50 years from now, maybe everything goes this way. But we still have to be able to use these legacy technologies because we have a multi-generational environment. We have uh, an environment where we have people who have a different abilities and different abilities, not just on income, but physical abilities. And cutting, disinvesting in one for the purposes of, of testing another is problematic. I think I, I think I don't think I could have phrased it any better than, than we just did there. I was going to add a couple of comments, though, that obviously, um, as technology evolves, um, making smartphone technology more accessible, both in terms of the initial upfront and service, is, is something that I think the industry as a whole is trying to trying to solve. And then I would take the, the question a little bit further and say it's not just about smartphones providing inherent data and information about. Uh, what's going on in the in the city, but increasingly the devices themselves are providing that information. You've got parking meters that are reporting in when the pace, when the spaces are, are open and vacant, or when they're occupied. You've got uh, inherent, um, you've got smart street lamps that are themselves detecting motion be up below them and reporting information back in. So I, I think while while the smartphone has put more processing power in my pocket than than probably landed the, the, you know, the, the spaceship on, on, on the moon. I mean, we're, we're at this point where there's an inherent array of sensors and services and devices that, and information that's, that's capable of coming from that device. But increasingly, all around us, all of these devices are, are reporting in, uh, or should I call it auxiliary information, that has value somewhere else. And that goes back to the, the initial point of, of while, uh, while there will be a, shall we say, a, a stratosphere or a, a range of, demographics in a city with different levels of access to technology, there will always be, I believe, services and, and means for reporting a pothole the good old-fashioned 311 way, but that will evolve with time and, and in the future, yeah, who knows? I mean, it, it could be anything that, that's reporting this pothole. I mean, will potholes be relevant? We'll, be all, we'll all be on hoverboards, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> At a breakfast last, uh, last Friday, the mayor said there was a study and Germany, and he thought that the same thing would exist if we did a study here, that they ask young people, what would you rather have, a, a smartphone or a car? And the overwhelming majority said a smartphone. And he says, boy, what a change, you know, if you had asked me when I was a, 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 a student, you know, there would have been no question, you know, I wanted a car, I wanted a car. And, and you know, the changing... What, what is considered important in today's world? And so are we moving towards a society where um, connectivity and communications is maybe more important than having our own automobile? Is that... Um, is so that so I, I'll take the quicker. I would say yes, because I think if you just look at the numbers and you look at the way the technology and smartphone type of technology is being adopted, I, I'm rooting that statement in the same, in the same survey. You, you see similar surveys as to whether people want internet or TV, and increasingly younger demographics are asking for the internet and not for television, a phone instead of a car. Um, and we're going to work out how our, how our cities uh, and how that infrastructure and the, and the environment that we live in needs to adapt uh, around that. Because I, I also see, I think it was uh, Steve Jobs said he doesn't like his kids to play on the iPad, right? He likes right. them to get outside and kick a, kick a ball and hit a baseball. So I think what I, what I, I mean, it's just the parent in me at this point. I think we also have a responsibility to make sure that we, we don't, we get the right balance in life. And so uh, I, I credit Steve Jobs for his not allowing his child to allegedly use these iPads. So I think there's a, there's a balance here of, of, of getting it right for, for the future generations. Any other thoughts on this of IBM looking at um, smart cities? Uh, are they looking at smart cities without cars and everybody on phones? Or 
Well, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to pit those two against each yeah. other so, yeah, <laughs> as a diary. But I, and for the most part, um, a, a car has a lot of externalities associated with it in terms of you know, pollution physically or just the space you need from zoning practices and policies in order to afford parking. Um, I think I read that a, a parking spot in the West Village just sold for a million dollars in New York. Wow. Um, so, I mean, those things take space and those things have a cost. So when I think about smartphones, I think one of the great advantages to them, of course, we could debate what cost that would have as well. Maybe we'll find out one day. As I have mine in my pocket humming away wondering what it's doing to my leg. Um, but it's, um, I think one of the great things about, about the, the diffusion of data um, is that it, it's, it may not have as, as defined externalities or social costs, uh, potentially, as something like driving a car would. Just one thought. Well, I mean, a lot of people have said this whole idea of fewer people trying to get driver's licenses is directly attributed mm -hmm. to the fact that when they're driving, they cannot be using their smartphones, they cannot be texting, they cannot be checking their email, or whatever it is that they want to be doing. You know, it's an inconvenience for them to have to drive and not be connected to this thing. And um, so my... I guess my real question is, are these things, the, the, our mobile devices, creating cities where we are going to have more human contact or less? Um, are we all just going to be walking around looking at our looking down? Uh, some people call it the look down moments or the look up moments. Um, or by creating more activity on the street, are these more opportunities for, for people to really interact, actually? Do what we're doing. You know, people coming closer, sitting closer, talking. Well, it, I mean, one data point is as, the, as these devices are becoming more popular and as social media is taking hold, you're actually seeing more people move into cities. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think if there were a very clear um, motivation for people who are, you know, living on their device not to want to interact with other people in the real world, you'd probably see a flight the other way. The only other thing I would say is, you know, I'm sure if that study were done in rural Nebraska, you might get a different result, right? I mean, people yeah. still need to get places. But there are not that many people. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I, I think in some ways it's really simple as I sit here thinking about it. It's like, what do these devices get us? So the, if you're a teenager, what are the two things you want, right? You want a date and you want a job, right? <laughs> and um, you, don't, you need a phone to get a date and to get a job, right? You don't need a car. Like, a car's not going to help you with either of those. And, and I actually think, interestingly, you could, you could probably scale this up. I mean, um, my colleague Chris Ledantic did work with homeless mothers in uh, Atlanta. And one of the things that they did, if I remember this research correctly, is like they, they gave them phones. And one of the reasons they needed phones is they needed phones to get a job, right? Like you need a phone to get a job, right? Yeah. And, and the phone in that way becomes much more immediately valuable than a car. So it's not, I mean, to me, it's not surprising. I think it's realizing that. These, the, what's that? You might need to go to work. Yeah, you might need it. Right. Well, you might, or you, right. Um, but without being able to be contacted, right? If I, if I can't contact you, I can't get the job. So I think in some ways it's, it's also realizing that I think we have to balance the, the idea that these are really special things and then also that they just happen to be the tool of the moment through which we are um, engaging in transactions, whether those are personal transactions or their business transactions, or whatever the case may be. And in the way that the car might have been two generations ago. All right. it, it's interesting to me that the, the word in both cases is the mobility issue. And so as, essentially what Carl's arguing is that the, the phone provides the mobility you want, while the car is, is the, second, the second tier component of that. And one of the interesting things in some of the new urban infrastructure projects that are going on um, globally is this question of daylighting projects. And I swear I, swear I will bring this back around. So the, the, it's the, the idea of so taking out freeways and, uh, and then putting something else in their place, so these ugly elevated freeways. So if you think of the Big Dig or you think of the viaduct coming down in Seattle, in both cases what they're doing there is they're building roads underground, right? So they're actually not changing a lot except they're about the question of the car. In some of the other places where they've taken down these roads, these uh, you know, freeways, elevated freeways, what they've left are linear parks. 
So the, the one that's the most um, famous is probably the Chungaechang in Seoul, where they left a, a linear park, which is actually a stream. And what they did was they invested in uh, east-west uh, public transportation so that people didn't the end a bus rapid transit. So that the fact that in, that was the east-west freeway that was eliminated actually didn't make anybody particularly, well, somebody will raise their hand and say they were mad, I was mad, <laughs> but it actually was feasible to do this in a relatively short period of time because of the increase in investments in the public transportation options that went with it. So it, it does get to this question of, yes, you need the car to get to a job if what we do is not invest in the other alternatives, right? And this is kind of where we are. We're in this moment where we have to decide, do we double down on this environment <laughs> that we've got or do we start making investments to make the transition? And how do we do that incrementally within the institutional framework that we already have? Or do we need to make some changes to that institutional and governance framework as well? So are you advocating um, our government structure or our citizens, whichever citizen led, actually trying to make a transition based on where society is going and saying, uh, is that, Am I hearing you? I mean, we are I'm, in Georgia. I'm starting the conversation. <laughs> well, we got Boston. Right, right but right, I, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, personally, I, I, I do feel a civic responsibility to try and help um, help a government improve its services. And um, I'm able to do that now because of this phone in my pocket in a way that I wasn't able to do mm -hmm. 10 years ago. I mean, if you imagine a macro view of a city with all of us millions of people who do have the phones – you could see the city breathe throughout the day. You could see the people come in from the suburbs, mill about in the city, do what they do during the day, and then diffuse back to wherever it is they live. As a, as a, as a government, I see that as an opportunity to do things like optimize surface transportation, right? Make sure the buses are going where people are actually starting and ending at the times of the day in which they're starting and ending there. So as a citizen, that does get me excited that, that I can play a role in engaging with policymakers, um, and you know, not just showing a pothole, but actually <laughs> providing information that can help optimize services that I, as a citizen, can benefit from. And Georgia Tech has been working, has developed, helped develop these apps of right. telling you when the bus is coming, when the trains are coming, and all that great stuff. Right. I, I would like to open it up um, to all of us to extend the conversation with you. I, w I would like to say a little bit about me. I, I grew up on the Georgia Tech campus. My dad taught architecture um, here for 30 years. And I grew up on North Avenue in a building that has been since torn down, the Burge Apartments. Um, and uh, I got my master's in urban, in urban studies, and planning has always been something that's kind of been with me. And, and seeing how Atlanta's changed over the years, good and bad. I mean, there was a time when the, you know, the tech campus was much more of a grid system, and then the highway engineers took over and started doing all these nice, wonderful, you know, kind of highway-like roads going through campus, and now they're trying to reintroduce a grid system. And it, it's just been fascinating to see how urban theories have played themselves out in Atlanta. And Atlanta's always been kind of a, a pioneer city. The Lochner Plan, which was uh, the really prototype for the highway system, was in Atlanta, uh, so we, we are kind of responsible for our interstate highway system, um, and uh, uh, public housing has got its start here with Techwood Homes, um, and that's changed, uh, obviously. And, as, and I joked earlier, we've done a lot of stupid things, tearing down perfectly um, I would not say perfectly good neighborhoods, but neighborhoods that maybe had uh, poor people living in them, and we thought this is one way to get rid of our poor neighborhoods and found out all you do is displace that problem. So there have been ways that, that we, can, we can write textbooks upon textbooks about what not to do in how we develop and design our cities, and I guess the real challenge and opportunity that we have ahead of us is how can we use technology and, you know, the, the digital era to actually create the cities that work for our time 
and for everyone in, in a way that creates environmentally sound communities and, and that can help really create a, a, a much more vibrant area that, that can help us really be a, a city that, you know, someone moves to when they're 14 and they say, aha, that's where I want to live when I grow up. Um, anyway, can, who has, yes, you have a question. Um, my name is Zuhar Rand, and I stood here last year. This is my second year at the uh, forum. I really enjoyed intellectually. It is very stimulating. And I had to be actually dragged because I wasn't feeling like coming <laughs> by my husband. Uh, and I'm glad I did. Um, I think, just like Carl said, and Maria, you stated really well, the, the, and considering it is the, it is, what is it? Um, people and technology, right? We're missing the people part, just like you said, the citizen part. We're talking about smart cities, and as someone who enjoyed last 23 years all this great country offers in terms of the technology, best of everything, and you and know, where are you uh, from and originally? Uh, Turkey. Okay. Now I am transitioning to Turkey, going back. And last month I was in Turkey, and when we think in terms of smart cities. Uh, my hometown is Antioch, southeast of Turkey. And you get grounded and you say, oh my God, oh my God, there are no ramps. There are no, uh, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. So just like you mentioned, the inequity, is it going to, are we talking about making life easier for some who are already at okay level? Or I think we're, we're forgetting the word for all people. And that is where the, the problem is. So when I didn't have three weeks of internet connection in my new place, I could use Wi-Fi somewhere else, I didn't miss it. I was more concerned, how are we going to create a temporary ramp we could use? We can't bring my aunt in her wheelchair from the front door, but maybe from the back we could just use you know, a makeshift or whatever you would call it. I was giving my dad descriptions to build something like this, so at least she could come from the back and then sit so and share some is quality. How can we ensure? It, it's more than it's basis? more than a question. It is it's a comment that we're missing the people part. I mean, wonderful things has been discussed, and and you also mentioned here. I think we just realize the realities for people, both locally, globally, is so different, and we are the elite people who really get to enjoy. I mean, we still can move around if we can. We still have the rams. We, we have our rights. We have our laws. But the, even the dissemination of the information to globally, when I kept saying, okay, so if we get a wheelchair, which is, could be, you know, she can manipulate and move around the house, then we need to worry about the car because her children are carrying her to the car. Then, oh, we don't even know there is a car that she can use with her wheelchair. Then you think about the road. Then how is it going to go? And those type of things. So when I think about the smart city, it is where everybody is lifted at the same time and happy and healthy and they're, they're fulfilled. And I think that part, that, that human part and um, like all. Yeah, I mean, I... I might dis dis disagree with that. I agree with you in principle, but I actually think that is happening in some places. I mean, we're it, working with cities that, um, you know, people may not have mobile devices in their pocket, but they're receiving social services and being able to use technology, you know, advanced analytics to predict which services are most likely to help them, you know, given their challenges for their specific family. So even if they're not necessarily participating, um, I guess directly would be the way to describe it, uh, they're, 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 likely huge beneficiaries of you know, the smarter city, of, of how technology can improve their lives, even if they're not the ones who necessarily touch the technology Absolutely. themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's all my focus is on us to technology, but I could not believe even a couple of months ago in Gwinnett County, a woman who cannot walk with 10, 15 strokes is still, it's just the policy is there, the law there. Uh, it's just working that system and, and making that policy, the implementation. Um, it, I mean, it's an awesome discussion. But and I, I do think that there was, um, back in the day, that, you know, when 
there was more regulation that the federal government would say, everyone has to be able to have phone service. So the urban areas would end up subsidizing rural areas where it cost a lot more to have phone service so that there would be universal phone service. Um, same was true for postal service. There was this understanding that this was something part of the public good um, and that idea that the federal government uh, was out there to look out for everyone. Yesterday, uh, I think uh, President Obama announced the idea that uh, the internet needs to have a similar sense of regulation uh, by the FCC and all of a sudden everybody is, wait a minute, this is huge government overreach. And, and again, I don't know enough about that particular plan, but my sense was it was the internet needs to be viewed as a, a public resource that has some kind of um, a, a public good. And, and you, were, you wanted to? No, 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 just another question. Yeah. But I don't know if y'all had any thoughts on that, and then I definitely wanted to. Any, any comments on, inform me if I'm totally off here. It, it's a good analogy, right? I mean, it, it doesn't cost 47 cents to, to mail a letter from Alaska to New York. It costs a lot more than that, but you can do it for, you know, one stamp because it's um, been deemed a public good. So um, that role has been, been played before. Yeah. I'll leave it there. <laughs> yes, did you want to come to a mic? Uh, are, we, are we trying to get mics? And you, did you have a question too? If y'all want to come and get close. I'm pretty well in the So I wanted to get back to your comparisons of uh, mobile phones versus automobiles and, and really recognizing that all of this is happening in the midst of uh, a shift, a demographic shift from suburban to urban mm -hmm. living and the expectations of young people about where they expect to live. Mm -hmm. And I think that explains uh, a lot of what you're seeing and I just wondered if you had further comments about the impact of that demographic shift on smart cities. I, 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 the, the challenge here is partly how uneven that is. So the, there are still young people who uh, live in suburbs, right, and who choose and move out from cities from their sort of college days and out to suburbs. So it's, it's not self-evident, I think, yet that that, that that move is a, to urbanization by a next generation, the way that suburbanization for previous generations was felt so total, though it wasn't, right, but it felt so total. Um, was, was in fact, we're not, we're still in that moment where we're not really sure, right? And part of that has to do with some, this transitional moment. So some really basic urban policy questions, like schools, right? So as soon as people have their kids, they still, so maybe the, the move out to the suburbs because of, of the schools. Things like concerns about uh, property and personal crime, right? So back to basic public services issues. So this, these things have still not been fully resolved. The motivation to resolve them, because there is, a, there is a generation that is now looking at the city as an option, right, as opposed to something you leave, rather than, <laughs> means that we've got to start thinking and, you know, not to, to keep saying the same thing over and over again, but these got, this, this question of the institutions and how we're going to actually to restructure these institutions to solve these problems so people can come back to the city. And this, this does come back to this, this point about what, uh, the question of density in cities. Some cities didn't give themselves over to the car in the first place, right? So our Paris, our, our London, you know, the congestion pricing boundary is actually well, a fascinating actually did. I mean, I, Well, I they mean, did some, I mean, I, but I, not. I remember when they just made cars all along, you know, the Seine. And then they had to start taking them out because they kind of destroyed some of the urban but anyway, right. No, no. I mean, I certainly would not argue that there were not accommodations made. Yeah. But the, the, the total commitment to a, a city built within the age of the automobile is something that, that we see more in this context. Yes. Okay. Let's see how loud you really are. <laughs>
So, in your mind, who would pay for that? It should be a general fund. It should, it should a be a general federal fund? I mean, should it be paid for uh, on a... We do have these things called taxes. <laughs> I know, I know, but I'm just saying it's... Uh, I'm just curious, because, I mean, there... Because it, I mean, I personally, I think that people have such a hard time even having that conversation um, right now. Just even, I mean, Minneapolis, St. Paul, when I went there, you know, they had some of the highest taxes per capita, and we were, and I was saying, well, in Georgia, they brag about how the state has the second lowest tax per capita than any other state in the country. And they said, really? And they brag about that? And I said, yeah, <laughs> they brag about that. He says, but he says, we look here as that is an investment in our community, in our state. And I said, that's not quite the way it's perceived here uh, in Georgia. So, I mean, I think that there's just things get very convoluted very quickly. And then I, I know... When I think of smart cities, well, what kind of smart city, if we look at Atlanta, would have in one region 80 different um, government units <laughs> in, in a, you know, in just what should be one metropolis? I mean, that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem very smart, but I haven't heard any of y'all talk about how we can use technology to break down our, our government borders, um, even though I would think that there would be ways that you could almost... I don't know if you need to break down. I mean, I do think you need, you, what you're suggesting, and I think it actually what several people have been... Cities are different, right? right. Boston is not Atlanta, and um, Atlanta is not Minneapolis, and I think it's important to recognize that those differences are both sort of material differences, like the actual structure, um, and cultural differences, and those cultural differences get played out in terms of the government. So, like, urban mechanics is awesome. Like, it is such a great thing. You can't reproduce it here. Right? It's just not going to happen. We've, we've actually, like, there's been hints of trying it, right? But there's things about the way that Boston runs as a city, the resources that are there, the kind of city it is, the way the government happens in Boston, that lets that happen. 
And so I think the challenge for us is to think about, okay, let's not, let's not get rung up over the fact that we can't reproduce that here. Let's instead say, what can we reproduce here? And in some ways, that's why your word community is, is much nicer, because somehow I always feel when we talk about cities, we think about a very specific kind of a city. But we think about community, something about that does open us up to the fact that there's a lot of differences here. And whether you're looking at it in terms of a human problem or a technical problem or the two combined, it's those differences that are going to be key. Yes. Okay. Yep. Come on. Um, I have a question for Stephen, I suppose. Is this my? Can people hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to give a specific example about what a smart city could be. And a smart city could be a safe city. I have a, my sister is involved in the transgender community, and they're trying to map unisex bathrooms and think about different signage for those bathrooms that would make transgender people feel safer or make that space more inclusive. So they're using a technology, they're, they're using data. Um, does AT&T have a passive role in that or an active role in that? And IBM could respond to that. But again, getting at this tension of civic innovation, citizen-based, community-based innovation, and what the role is of a more a profit-driven um, entity. So, so I think in, uh, in very simplistic terms, I mean, AT&T, um, values itself as a, as, a, as a responsible corporate citizen and in itself partners in, in many communities, both on, on non-for-profit activities, sponsoring local communities, um, and working on, on trials, proof of concepts, and, and a whole host of different programs that are, are not necessarily focused, uh, as, as, you, as you succinctly put it, at a, at a, a profitable activity. Um, so, so we don't take our, our responsibility back to the, the broad, organized, broad community as a uh, likely, and we, we'd like to make sure that we, we are given an, an active part of that contribution because we think that involvement is, is valuable to us. So we, we don't, you can't, um, in, I, I don't believe in, in corporate America that you can get away with, with not um, sitting purely on one side of the fence and not making sure that you get that right balance view for the, the population and, and people as a whole. Um, so I think in, in, in getting that right balance between um, maintaining a, a core business that allows us to do the, the secondary projects is also important. I mean, some of the, some of the funding and some of the, 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 the money that we put into communities, some of the activities we do in terms of supporting um, local initiatives, I think, is, is important to try and to stimulate. Uh, and I think big companies have a, have, a, have a high level responsibility to be involved in that. So, so at a very high level, it's, uh, to me, it's always about maintaining that right balance uh, and making sure that you get actively involved in the communities and actively get involved in supporting those, those environments. It sounds like there might be a business opportunity yeah. for an app. Yeah. <laughs> for, you know. uh, and did you want to... Sure, I mean, it's, we're, you know, as corporate partners or whatever, we're also citizens, right? <laughs> so it's important for us. It, the only thing I wanted to add, by the way, that was very well said, um, is that I think if, if, if your sister um, was, you know, she would never want to wait on an IBM or an AT&T or even a local government to, to deliver that to her because, frankly, we'd never get it right. So I think I, a lot of the times I view our role um, as that, is that broker of a platform or an incubator of data. That we can help with that part, right? And then we get all the really creative people who are doing those wonderful things in the community um, to go and build and, and, and really be innovative. Um, on that front, but I think you know, from our perspective, we want to help the enablers of that. But we'll, if hopefully, no one would ever rely on us to, to be that creative and that um, you know on that on that level, because frankly, we wouldn't get it right. And people will be creating wonderful things like that all the time. Um, a few weeks ago, Jeff Arnold spoke to the Rotary Club of Atlanta, and he talked about his new company. He was a founder of WebMD, and the company he's working for they use big data for all things medical and you know I guess you have they measure everything about your body so whatever the device and I can't remember the name of his company but it 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 it, it wakes you up at that perfect time that you're supposed to be woken up in between the you know dream sleep and 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and then, but other things, what, what exactly when, that it can tell you pretty much when you're going to, you know, what your life expectancy is going to be and what you need to eat and what you need to do and pretty much gives you what you should do in your life and has technology kind of, um, I don't want to say control you, but in many ways it, it doesn't let you really live your life and make your own mistakes and eat too much or drink too much. It's telling you this: you need to exercise this much a day and this is how you'll get to live longer. And, and these are all very helpful things. And I guess for, for me, when I'm looking forward, are we going to be able to control technology for our own good, or are we going to let technology control us? And, and I think that that is one of the big questions that I have going forward, and, and especially when we look at controlling our environments. And are we going to be, as I see many people already looking at their phones, I mean, can we do it? <coughs> You know, we are we going to be present in our in our day to day life and live among each other as individuals? Or are we going to be always um, connected to that other world and not be able to to live in the moment? And and I think these are things that are tough. I find myself guilty as charged, and um, you know, it's 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 something that. We, as we create our cities, uh, what kind of cities we want to have. And, and on that note, because we are wrapping up here, I just wanted to say that, uh, wrap up a few things that I learned today. Um, you know, when we're designing uh, our cities, are we looking at uh, citizen-led design or is it from uh, uh, top down? We need to view data as a natural resource, and we have to. Uh, it's important that government plays a role in brokering that natural resource. The challenge is how do we make people aware of the natural value of that resource? Um, people don't buy infrastructure. Um, cities are fairly smart on their own. Be aware of repercussions when we change policies that we think are uh, with good intentions. Um, you know, we talked about being able to use technology to improve our communities, like taking photos of potholes, but we already have legacy technology that can do much of the same thing. Um, you know, technology, um, as technology evolves, um, we are making smartphones be able to do, uh, to become more accessible, uh, but it's also about increasing devices that are part of our daily lives, whether it's um, parking meters, et cetera. Issues of phone versus car, internet versus TV. Um, what does that mean about where we're going? More people are moving to cities. Um, what, why is it that people want these devices? Let's get down to it. If you're a teenager, you want a date and a job. Um, <laughs> they are the tools of the moment. Mobility is what you want. And we are at that moment in time where we are, where we're either going to make a transition and in making investments in, in the new infrastructure like transit, or continue doing what we've been doing. There is that demographic shift from suburban to urban. Um, the challenge is how uneven those shifts can be, and how do you serve everyone? There are basic urban policy issues that, in, such as education and crime, and how do you address those? And how do you restructure our existing institutions? It's not just smart cities. We're talking about smart communities. So smart communities are in the suburbs and small towns and all over our country. Um, you cannot apply what makes a smart city in one area of the country the same in another. Cities are different. There are differences, there are cultural differences, and actual structural differences. But we have to always balance our business needs and our social needs in, as we proceed with technology. I hope you've learned something from this program, as I have. Let us thank our great panel for helping us. Terrific. Thank you so much. Upward and onward. Thank you again.
I'm hoping all our panel will be here with us uh, during the reception tonight and be able to can engage the conversation. I do think Jennifer was one step away to uh, asking for revolution, so we should discuss that over wine. And the most tweeted comment, I'm sure, was what do teenagers want, a date and a job. So thank you again. Terrific. So um, where we are in the program is each year I get a bit of time that I either have the opportunity or the requirement to try to stitch a number of these pieces together um, and try to find insightful things to say that both exemplify tremendous amounts of Georgia Tech research, which is the fun part, but then nevertheless try to add to uh, the insightful contributions that we've already had today and we will have tomorrow. Um, but I want to take a bit of time to talk to you about um, our overarching perspectives around connected life. And in particular, I want to raise some issues that don't necessarily match the immediate rhetoric of connectivity. So um, I, got, I started with the connectivity theme actually about three years ago. I was at the World Economic Forum meeting in uh, Dalian, uh, China. And I was in a session where they had just started to say, we want to talk about hyperconnectivity. And hyperconnectivity was focused on kind of the overarching, uh, redundant abundance of connection that was enveloping our world. Uh, so, for example, the conversation started about how fast a meme could travel on social media. And there were many traditional marketing and communication representatives for companies that were just truly aghast with how quickly the reputation and what people thought of their company could change out from under them despite very well-laid marketing plans. Um, and then there were uh, perhaps uh, present, or we, we knew it was coming, there were discussions of, of how fast viruses would travel worldwide. Um, and uh, specifically when we were looking at the interconnectivity of, of transportation. So I came from that meeting thinking that we were, we were headed toward this world of, of overabundance of connectivity, and our job was to grapple with that. And over the time, I realized, and this is, this is inspired by so much of the work here at Georgia Tech and so much of the work with our partners, that there's so many other parts of connectivity that are not just about it's going to happen and it's complex and hairy, but there are many ways that we actually need to forge connectivity where it doesn't exist. There's many ways that our hyper-connected world in one side is creating an under-connected world in other areas, and that we have to grapple with many of the opportunities and challenges that lay before us. So in the time that I have with you this afternoon before we move to some closing remarks and get you to the reception, I want to spend a bit of time highlighting that with a number of projects with our partners. Um, if nothing else, you can just do a, a tick count on how many Georgia Tech projects I tried to mention in a 30-minute time period. Um, so I want to start with uh, one of our favorite projects our, with our partners at Steelcase, uh, what we fondly call Magic Window. And Magic Window is, at its simplest, uh, a window between two worlds. So this is a portal, um, and in particular, you can stand in front of the Magic Window and you can see into another space. Okay, well, those of us who have been around telepresence and teleconferencing and media spaces we're used to the idea, but the magic part of Magic Window is that it's not just a simplistic connection. It's just not a simple notion of creating connectivity, but it's understanding how you would design those portals. So one of the things that's neat about Magic Window, and I'm pretty sure you get to try it at the demo reception night, is as you lean in or look through or around that window, your view into the other space mirrors that. It complements that. And it actually is counterintuitive in terms of, of when you lean in, the obvious thing to do is make it smaller, but you're actually looking for more information, so it opens up in some interesting ways. The second thing the window does is it's not just, it's not just a window, it's not just a portal, but the whole point is that you're trying to create a meaningful connection between two spaces. So we decorate the periphery of the window with all sorts of information about information about what's going on in the other space. It may be video materials telling you the story of the space, in this case, looking into the aware home. Um, or it may be, if this is a distributed collaboration, it may be, here are the latest project results, or here are the latest discussions, here is the content that is linking these two spaces together in a particular way. So one of the expectations when we need to look at connectivity is it's not just a simple connection, place to place, person to person, but through the magic, through the technology, we can do so much more 
when we start looking at this from the notion of spaces into places, and I'll talk about that further. But we've continued this work with the Midtown Buzz Project, so a whole other set of researchers and our partnership with Midtown Alliance, where we're taking that notion of connecting uh, spaces and places, but making it mobile. So Midtown Buzz is uh, you know, a handheld app that uh, can, uses our Argon augmented reality technology platforms as well as others, and it allows us to layer on information about the spaces and places of Midtown. So in this particular area, you can see the future, right? So in this case, the future is seeing the development or seeing what's up and coming within the Midtown area. And um, I don't have a picture of it, but we also have a number of uh, projects that are also about looking into the past. And so the goal with this mobile platform, and you know, yes, right now it's on a little handheld and someday it will be Google Glass or someday it will be something that's, that's even better than that, is that you're walking through Midtown and you, at the same time, you can interact with past, present, and future. And I want you to think about that for a little bit because this notion of how we think about time and how we navigate our world is actually fairly, it's been a small period of time, the way it's worked, the way it does. I was at the dinner table with my kids, and I was explaining how it was the synchronization of the railroads that led to our time zones and led to the synchronization of, uh, you know, we all know what time it is, and it's 30 minutes or so until it's time for food and drink. Um, before that, essentially, towns looked up and said, okay, this is noon, because the sun's right at top, and that's noon for us, and noon for another town is, is different, and so on and so on. It was, con it was contextualized locally, and we lived quite well like that for, for many, 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 many generations. Time can change, and may change in some very interesting ways for us. So we're already living in a world where we're connected physically, and we're connected on our little devices. And you guys are being good right now. I have most of the eyeballs. But you're already living in multiple worlds. What happens if we, if we push that further? What happens if it makes perfect sense for the organizers of this meeting to come into the space and say, OK, I want to, I want to be in this room Wednesday morning. Right? And I want to see the setup, and I want to see everything as it would be organized. What does it mean if I walk into a room and said, I missed this meeting. Take me back to last Tuesday. Right? Why can't I just participate in different time zones? Okay, see, I'm already scaring some of the folks in the audience, so this is great. Um, so let's play with space and time in some ways that we haven't thought of before when we think about the future of connectivity. Other types of connections, I want to talk about what is it we need to forge? What is it that we need to make happen? Um, I was curious in the, in the conversations that we've had so far today where we've talked about the future of the city. Um, we haven't talked about uh, older adults as much, and we haven't talked about where they are, uh, where they are living both in ur urban environments and suburban environments, and how they are frequently isolated. And more and more information is coming out that shows the danger, the health de detriments of social isolation for older adults, which can be as up, to, up to as much as 40% of our population for older adults 60 and above. Social isolation may be just as damaging to your health as heart disease or even smoking packs of cigarettes a day, right? And so we understand now what it would, what the impact of social isolation is doing uh, to the citizens, to the senior citizens, to the older adults in our country. But what types of connections are we going to forge? What types of ways are we going to, to bridge those gaps? because of uh, the silver tsunami, because of the aging population, because uh, this is an ever-growing problem for our country and others. Uh, so this is a pointer to a project called PRISM um, that is a partnership within the CREATE Center. Um, the PI of the CREATE Center here at Georgia Tech is Wendy Rogers. Sarah Saja is the PI uh, at the University of Miami. And it's looking at many ways we could think of this as a, a, you know, a simple uh, network computer, uh, portal computer for the home for the use of senior adults. But the questions that they are asking, and they're actually doing this in a clinical trial, is what do we need to provide for older adults that are, for the most part, uh, less able to leave their homes? What kinds of ways can we add connections and make a clinical, make a health impact on their lives? So they're looking at things, you know, we have uh, older adults using email for the first time. But it's, it's more than that. It's more about lowering the barriers to feeling engaged, to feel that they're participating in a community. Um, it's ways of making spaces and places seem closer to them. Um, it may be ways of playing with time. Okay, you can't eat dinner with the grandchildren, but are there ways of capturing that that nevertheless makes that connectivity seem closer? So there's 
straightforward, so to speak, things that we can do very carefully in our design work that may have high consequences, a uh, long-term impact for these populations if we acknowledge that connectivity is not assumed. And for this population, connectivity is vitally important to their health and well-being. Other forms of connection uh, deal with the notion of local economies and local commerce. And I don't know if Carl is still in the room. I think he's taking a well-deserved break from the panel. But part of the work that he does, and he actually has a, a program called Food Hacks, which is not gen genetically modified food. But nevertheless, it's about food. It's about hacking the food systems, and it's about hacking the production of uh, produce in local arenas. And one of the things that we have seen in terms of the economics and in terms of our overly connected uh, and overly industrialized society is a reduction of local production of food and local distribution of food. And so the question is, what would we need, what kinds of connections would we need to forge to be able to create uh, a more vibrant local production of food uh, within our urban and suburban and other communities? And so part of his research has looked at the question of saying, you know, sometimes it's about access to information. You know, this particular plot that you drive by every single day, well, who actually owns that? Who governs that? How could you actually connect that? How do you forge the connections to the Whole Foods or to the local farmer's market? How do you actually work within that regulatory space? Because it's not as it was 50 some odd years ago where you just had your, you know, you had your, your garden or you had your local crop and you brought it into town to sell it. We live in a, uh, in a more complicated regulated world that is setting up barriers to the types of connectivity that we need for local engagement. And in some sense, just like we have to forge connections for our senior adults in ways that we might not have had to have done in the past, we have to forge connections for local economic development in ways that those barriers did not exist uh, before in our society. So, so many things that we assume we're connected and are working fine aren't, and that's uh, a focus of our research as well. Now, one of the areas where we've seen tremendous speculation, and we're a long way from understanding this, is the new sharing economies, right? So ways that uh, instead of moving towards ownership, people are moving towards uh, economic systems around sharing. So whether it's Uber, Airbnb, um, I'm an old VRBO user, you know, ways that we're moving from uh, pure ownership models to sharing models. And some of these are quite contentious and are quite disruptive, and we're a long way from knowing how these are going to settle out. But um, I think at this point in time, I didn't anticipate we would have so much of a conversation about this, but let's go back to the teenager. You know, the teenager wants a date and a job, and what do you need more these days? You need the phone versus the car. If you look at how we have become connected around mobile technologies and around inter -technolo internet technologies as a whole, this notion of needing to own a car is disappearing for some segments of our society. Now, is it going to disappear for all segments of our society? No, but it may make the difference between a one-car versus a two-car family, and it certainly may make the distinction between car ownership in those pivotal years of post-high school through college and into the first job. And if you change consumer patterns at that time period, you may change them significantly. Um, Paul, a uh, different Paul, uh, from Steelcase and I were up uh, uh, working uh, with uh, the leadership of Ford. And um, I can tell you that this notion that young kids might not really want to own a car was not settling well with their notions of how do we deal with dealerships and how do we deal with marketing plans. But the sharing economy is doing more than just providing convenient services. When you couple that with transitions into urban environments, when you couple that with different economic constraints on our world, when you couple that with the fact that uh, giganomics may be more the norm. So many people have heard of giganomics. So when I graduated from college, uh, the pinnacle, I went to NC State for my undergrad. You know, you went to work for IBM, you went to Cary, you got a nice house, and that was kind of the model of, of success. Um, I went to graduate school instead, and everything went off the rails. Um, but uh, now that is not the model, right? The model is much more of assuming that you're going to have a transitory career path, assuming that you're going to work for many companies, assuming that you might actually not be working one regular job, but you may be working three jobs, and you may be managing that, that yourself. 
Well, the, how that economic reality then impacts notions of ownership is going to be quite significant. And if you couple that with these technologies around sharing, uh, the, our ideas and expectations of what we're expecting out of smart cities, what we're expecting out of sm smart services, may be much more radical than we feel that it is now. Uh, so this is something to watch out for, and I think it's going to be a theme that we will continue to return to. Um, but today and tomorrow, we're going to talk more about cars. Uh, we're going to talk more about the connectivity around autonomous driving, and we're going to talk around the notion of urban logistics. And I'm glad that Internet of Things has come up. Um, last year, it was an explicit theme in our forum, and um, this year is actually kind of more interwoven in many of the things that we're talking about. But the first notion of autonomous cars is not about connecting people. It's about connecting cars with each other and with their infrastructure. And actually taking people out of the equation is, you know, the most of the point, right? And, you know, part of what we've seen, if you look at, at uh, where luxury automobiles, automobiles are going, is more and more of this technology is, is you know, appearing in the cars that we have now. Um, you can't have that accident that I had um, when I was a young driver straight out of college when you, you, somebody's in your blind side and you shift over to the left because the car will sense it and they will do their best to avoid uh, you uh, engaging in that dangerous situation. It was a little scratch, it wasn't bad. Um, so the, the autonomous part is showing up more and more in our automobiles and one of the things that we may not realize as drivers is how much agency is slowly you know, being taken away from us for, for good or for bad. But most of the rhetoric has been around these types of situations, right? Urban logistics, you know, how do you deal, and this of course is the 405 in Southern California for those who recognize it. You know, how do we deal with uh, the overabundance of traffic and the need for uh, automated systems to make this better for us? The need for that instead of going into the, the pay for play lane or still instead of going into the carpool lane, you will go into the lane that says, I relinquish control of my car, just get me from point A to point B, and I'm willing to go there. Now, you add into this a touch of the sharing economy and Uber and other types of services, and this starts to happen faster than you would imagine. But nevertheless, and you guys should take these questions to the panel that we have tomorrow afternoon, this is a pretty complex system, right, that we are attempting to automate in some, in some significant ways. What I told the folks at Ford and what I talked to other folks about is let's start looking at the burbs, right? And in particular, let's go back to those senior adults a few slides ago. So if you look at isolation by senior adults and you look at the needs for aging in place, you see two major areas. One of the major areas you see is health in the home, right? How do you keep senior adults healthy within the home out of acute uh, care settings for as much as possible? The other thing you hear about is transportation or the lack of accessible transfer transportation. Where are most of these aging adults going to live for the next few decades? They're living in the homes that they bought. Perhaps they bought them even post-World War II homes. They're living in the burbs. Most of them are going to be women, and most of them are going to live alone, and they're going to be isolated within their own siloed home. So if you want a soft target, if you want kind of an easy target for autonomous driving, let's focus on the needs of senior adults you don't have to get there fast, right? They're not asking autonomous cars to drive at 120 miles per hour to get them to work while they're, you know, on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, but they need reliable, safe, trusted transportation. Let's think about the challenges of connectivity, not as siloed pieces of our infrastructure, where communication and email connectivity is over here and transportation connectivity is over here. Oh, and by the way, economic and job connectivity, that's somewhere else. These are interconnected systems. And what we have in front of our nation is a set of crisis points, and especially the crisis point of aging in place is one that we need to be attending to. And by the way, if you're working for a car company, this is a really interesting space. Uh, to work in because there are many, many appreciative individuals that whether you do it through autonomous driving or you do it in, uh, I mean, you know, my parents aren't going to call Uber. Um, but if you do it in a, in a system that would be trusted and reliable, doesn't have to be fast, but it has to be trusted, um, could have a huge, huge impact uh, for a major portion of our population. 
So uh, one of our colleagues is not here today, Raul Basoli, and I want to pay attention to some of his work. He's in Paris right now. Aww. So let's all collectively feel sorry for Raul. Not. Um, he and a bunch of our colleagues are at Viz Week in Paris. So um, they're having a great time having their annual conference and the being in Paris part. Um, but uh, Raul was recently selected from the Center for Global Enterprise, which is a research institute uh, led by Sam Palasamo, uh, following his leadership of IBM, uh, to look at the needs of complex enterprises and especially complex business needs. And so uh, what Raul and Peter, who may be here, uh, Peter Evans is working with, is a uh, new area which he has coined called computational, computational enterprise analytics. And he, Raul, is now one of four people who have been funded by this center uh, to do research in this space. And the reason I want to bring up co uh, computational enterprise analytics is so much of the discussion around big data uh, is around logistics, it's around optimization, it's around how do you hone a system to make it better within the constraints of how it works now, or constraints that are 100% consumable through computation. And one of the questions that we need to continue to engage in as a community is what is the limits of computational capabilities and what are the limits of human capabilities and how do we combine those in even more in interesting ways? And I know our healthcare discussion is going to, to bring us there tomorrow as well. So the idea between enterprise analytics is it's a big data problem. And it's a big data problem in terms of markets and in terms of supply and consumers and how you understand the future of your business enterprise. But it doesn't make the assumption that big data can do it all by itself. All right? It's framing the big data and visualization questions in tandem with visualization, human consumption, and decision making. And so where this team is going is saying, all right, we know that business leaders have to grapple with massive amounts of data. We're not going to automate that for them but we're going to work directly with them in terms of the enterprise analytics that they need. So this is a program that has just started. Um, we'll be hosting a conference on behalf of Raul next year. He'll be working in terms of some prototype tools, which will then be taken to a, a consortium of CEOs to, uh, to continue to engage. Uh, and, the, uh, and again, the question here that I want you to take away from this is that this notion of connectivity, this notion of data, we have to push through the question of just uh, analytics for logistics, for, uh, um, for optimization. We're going to have to push farther to say that what we can understand from these systems, what we can understand from our new forms of connectivity will take us part of the way. And we need to go back to that, I think, um, some of the skill sets that Steve was talking about when we first started our program this afternoon. We also need to understand the best human skills that are going to come into play and how do we pull these together. So this question exists for enterprise analytics. This question also exists for the challenges that we just discussed in innovation districts. So uh, if you can't already tell, Jennifer Clark is one of our uh, major gurus on campus in terms of the uh, question of urban innovation, in terms of policy and innovation districts. Where we need to go with the things that Kwanzaa was saying, with the things that Cha was saying, uh, the topics that our panel just discussed, is not just about automating the pothole detection, although that's kind of nice, but the questions are about how do we design a new ecosystem, how do we design a new terrain to meet the needs of the modern city, the modern suburb, the modern rural environment, right? Smart isn't just about optimization, and SMART isn't just about automation, but SMART is how do we configure a system, how do we configure a set of connections to meet the needs of where we are at today. So innovation districts, in contrast to industrial manufacturing districts, such as Carl was mentioning, and then the old-fashioned research parks, again, a nod to Cary, North Carolina, um, innovation districts are designed around connectivity. They are designed around the connectivity of entrepreneurs, around major universities, around local businesses, but it's not just sufficient to plop them into one place and assume that it will work, right? And Shannon Powell will be back with us uh, tomorrow from Midtown Alliance and can talk to us at length about the question of how do you foster connections? And connections are everything from uh, big data analysis to walking distance to Starbucks, right? 
how do we foster the connections of how this ecosystem will engage each other to meet our needs going forward. It's not going to happen automatically. The internet hasn't solved everything for us. Um, and just because we can email each other and just because we can read uh, blog posts about each other doesn't mean we have met these problems uh, going forward. All right, and if I'm going to talk about how computation hasn't taken care of everything, um, we're going to get to uh, learning healthcare systems, and I'm just going to give an advertisement uh, for what Bill Stead uh, is going to be speaking with us about tomorrow. But the goal of where we are trying to get with many of these complex systems is uh, a human in the loop, not just automation, not just logistics. How do we have better decision making? And then how does the system learn over time? And uh, there's probably, not counting government, because I will cede this to Kwanzaa Hall, there's probably uh, not another system besides government, besides healthcare, that, that makes this so difficult. And so what we're going to hear from Bill and what we're going to hear from the panel tomorrow and a number of researchers is how do we constantly mine data to understand what's working within our systems and what needs to be improved. All right, so you already going to anticipate that I'm going to say that this is a human in the loop process, right? You can't just expect the system to say, oh, the patients would be better if you did something 10% differently. Just trust the system, even if it's called Watson, right? That's not going to happen, right? So we first have to have a system where we have the human in the loop engagement. But a learning system does something else besides that, right? What do we do when we learn? We ask questions or in a formal sense, we create hypotheses. So what we're starting to see in learning healthcare systems and what we should expect to see in other interconnected big data systems is systems that form hypotheses and they test them. Well, that sounds very clean and scientific, but does anybody remember the, uh, the Facebook hypotheses that what was rolled out a few months ago? Right, do you remember that? And what was the dating website um, that had the, Keith's going to remember. What? Okay, Cupid, right? Those were learning systems that were rolling out hypotheses, right? They were rolling out hypotheses of, oh, if we match people in different ways, we're going to see what happens, and we're just not going to tell them that we're not using optimal matchmaking algorithms because we're curious, right? Um, we're going to uh, feed people different information in Facebook because we're curious about how they will react to that, all right? These are hypotheses generation that I don't particularly approve of, right? But the open question for our community is what does it mean for these systems, these highly connected systems, to formulate hypotheses and test them because that's how learning happens. And learning can happen in a person-by-person -person slow pace, right? I have two kids in school. I'm, I'm familiar with that pace of learning. Um, our learning can happen by Facebook running thousands of experiments at the same time, but we may not know it's occurring, right? So where, where is that dividing line? Where is that point that we're going to draw? What is that place in, in, you know, where is that line in the sand where we expect hypothesis generation to be part of a learning highly connected system, and what does that mean? So everybody remember that question for Bill Stead uh, tomorrow when we talk about healthcare. Speaking of healthcare, um, I want to bring out attention to a, a really favorite piece of work that I like. This is uh, actually not Georgia Tech. I will, ex I will uh, expose that, but it's by Kate Crawford at Microsoft Research. And it's looking at the notion of predictive privacy because we've, we are frequently talking about connectivity as a, a potential violation of privacy, right? Um, pick your favorite company, Target, Home Depot, violation, connectivity, uh, private information was taken away. This is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we're looking at. And what Kate in particular is looking at is not that you can get personal information about me and you've revoked, you've violated my privacy, but if you stitch enough different pieces of information about me scattered across the internet, you can predict things about me that I am, would not have imagined had ever been disclosed. Um, the famous case is Target Corporation. So Target gets nailed twice in this discussion. Um, so uh, Target, uh, as a great marketing, said that it's really great if they can predict their customers who are pregnant, 
right? Uh, for those of you who ever been through this process, you will recognize that as soon as corporations realize that you're expecting a child, you get deluged with advertisements uh, for every possible thing that you didn't know you needed when you were going to have a newborn. So Target uh, was looking at sampling its buyer patterns. How many people have heard this story? All right, sampling patterns to figure out that a consumer was pregnant and then um, sent some paper mail to that consumer uh, suggesting baby products that this person would eventually want to buy or, or pregnancy-related products. The challenge being that this particular consumer was a 15-year-old girl and her dad got the mail first. All right, dad wrote Target angrily, how dare you suggest this, and then the dad wrote back later and said, well, yeah, you were right. But nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, if you look at the notion of privacy, the condition of being pregnant is something that would be, would be protected health information, right? My uh, physicians cannot disclose this information, right? That is, that is, uh, that, that's covered under regulation, except that is that regulation moot now because Target can discover this. So this, the question for us around connectivity and privacy is not just who has what information and how do we keep them from disclosing it, but who has what pieces of information that can be stitched together in some really creative and interesting ways. And Kate's argument is that we need to focus away from protecting the silos of information that needs to happen, but we need to be protecting or regulating the questions or answers that can be discerned across disparate parts of data. And that the regulation should be about you can't disclose that someone is pregnant as opposed to you have to protect health information within a healthcare system is a possible example. So I want to talk about a different form of information um, and, and give you some uh, counterpoints. So in a few minutes, uh, when I finish talking with you, uh, we're going to hear uh, the award announcements from our Convergence Innovation Competition. So in short, this is a competition on the Georgia Tech campus uh, for students to design mobile apps and services to improve the experience of being a part of Georgia Tech. Uh, one of the uh, first place winners in the campus community area worked on a system that they call sexual assault transparency. And the motivation with this system is not about an overabundance inf of information, but actually a lack of information. So in this case, we're forging connections and we're trying to create data where it doesn't exist. Statistically speaking, so what do we know about data patterns across the US, is that one in five women will be assaulted, sexually assaulted, where, when they're on a university campus. However, if you look at what the data shows, so for example, with these predictions, the number of assaults on the Georgia Tech campus should be around 342. If you look at the average reporting, what we have is 18. So what we have in this case is an under abundance of data. We have an, a, an, a set of connections that haven't been created, and the absence of that data has profound impacts on our campus and on, on others. So in this case, this is the opposite side of the problem, which is to say, okay, we have a sense of what should be happening within the data, but in the absence of creating anonymous reporting that allows the campus, that allows the Women's Resource Center, and allows other women to see the general patterns of what's happening on campus, we lose the opportunity to make our campus a better place, provide a safe uh, environment on our university campuses and moving forward. So this is one of the projects that is going to be demonstrated and that the project team members, some of them are hanging out over here, are also going to be at the reception tonight. I want to talk about two other areas where stitching together information uh, is going to cr create uh, a way to empower individuals. And the last part of this is looking at that connectivity and big data is not just about making cities smarter or making health systems smarter, but it should also be empowering individuals in terms of their daily lives. So uh, we talked about sexual assault transparency. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is Rosa Ariaga and uh, Agatha Rosca uh, in our child development lab, which is just right across the street. And part of what they're looking at is how do we collect the data that helps us understand uh, developmental delays, developmental disorders in uh, younger kids. And in particular, their work is focused on children with autism. But in this case, the data that is missing, the picture that is missing, is understanding uh, what normal looks like. You know, what does it look like for a child to be normal? Uh, what does it look like for a five-year-old who's normally playing back and forth, or a, a smaller child who's playing, you know, hide and seek? And then from those deviations from normal, we can start to understand the patterns around developmental delays. And then the second part of this, which then is more empowering to the, to the children with autism, 
is then how do we understand information and data about a particular child against that backdrop. So again, we're filling in the data against that backdrop to know that a particular therapy or technology for children with autism is working. And the brilliant part I love about this is not only is it about creating more effective therapies, but it's about impacting the policy around uh, therapy for children with autism as a whole because in the absence of data, most of those services are not reimbursed because we don't have effective data to show that the therapies are effective. So what Georgia Tech researchers are attempting to do is fill in that data so that we have the knowledge so that we can create, in some sense we're talking about higher level forms of connectivity around policy, the ultimate aim of that research. And then the last project I want to focus on uh, takes this notion of how do you take general health care information and empower individual to another level. So this is um, a project that is called um, My Journey Compass, uh, and it's a uh, engagement that we have in uh, the Rome community, uh, Rome, Georgia, not the other Rome, uh, the Rome community around uh, technologies for breast cancer patients. And the goal of this project is how would you take all of the information that we have around women and their breast cancer treatments and their journeys of their health care, and then how do we take information around the specific individuals and create a tablet computer that is designed personally for them? So how many Diamond Age fans, how many sci-fi readers do I have in the room? Okay, this is sad. All right. Go Google or Amazon it right now. This is your required reading, Neil Stephenson, before he got really kind of crazy. Um, this is uh, Neil Stephenson's book, uh, and it looks at many technologies that we're working on today, including augmented reality, but he talks about uh, the young lady's illustrated primer. Right? And okay, I've got a few folks who are like, this is the whole point of this book, right? Um, and in the Young Ladies Illustrated Primer, it is the optimized educational experience for this child. What we're trying to do with this particular project is creating the optimized healthcare support experience for this particular woman um, as she's grappling with breast cancer. So every single day, day in and out, you pick up the tablet. This is where you are in your journey. This is what you're, uh, whether you're facing chemo, uh, whether you're going back for reconstructive surgery, whether you're dealing with particular side effects. How would you have that? personalized, optimized support. So when I hear personalized medicine, I don't hear genetics. When I hear personalized medicine, this is what I hear. So in close, uh, as we move forward for the rest of the, the forum, I want you to think around these themes in some different ways to challenge the notion of connectivity, to challenge the notions of, con of how would we design connectivity, where would we assume it to be, but it isn't, and we need to forge, forge it. We need to make it happen. And how do we make sense and manage the complexity of the connectivity we have? And data is a, is a big issue with that. So redefining places, right? So great colleague Steve Harrison at Xerox Park uh, defined for me that you know space is this physical construct, right? We're all physically in a space, but a place is that physical construct and all the social assumptions that come with it. Right, so you know, right now we're in an auditorium and it vaguely makes sense that I'm standing up here waving my hands and walking back and forth and you're mostly looking and listening to me because that is a social construct within this, this place. When we talk about forging new connected spaces, we need to step away from connecting spaces and talk about connecting places. And if you're connecting two homes versus you're connecting two public parks versus you're connecting two work environments, those are very different places, and the types of technology that we need to design for that should be radically different, and those are the questions that we should be asking. We need to talk about the social connections that are our fabric of society, whether we're grappling with social isolation or we're reforging local economies and re reforging local production. Um, there are connections that are absent now that might have been in place just a decade or so ago. And just because we're overly connected in some areas doesn't mean we're going to be connected in others. And that is a challenge and that is a, a mandate for our work. We need to understand what it takes to have systems that learn. Um, we're going to tackle this in spades tomorrow morning. Um, and then we're going to take a different uh, tack on it with automated systems. But go back to that question that I asked you. Systems that learn are systems that can ask questions. They're, they're systems that can um, generate hypotheses. 
What does that mean within the types of systems that we want to learn, types of systems that we want to engage and have part of our daily lives? Um, and I did think it was fair that the, the panel redefined smart cities to smart communities. And I think in this case, we need to remember that smart systems are not just computers, but they're technical systems working in tandem with individuals. So learning is a collaborative process. We need to talk about what it means to empower individuals. Right now, a lot of the connectivity is about making corporations smarter, um, making large-scale systems smarter, making them optimized. This needs to also come back to the value to the individual. And there are ways that we can do that in terms of visualization, in terms of engagement, in terms of data analytics. But it shouldn't just be about, for example, making healthcare payers more profitable. Um, but it should also be about improving patient experiences. And we need to figure out how to do both together. And then finally, um, going back to the World Economic Forum, their notion of hyperconnectivity was really looking at the global landscape. And I think those are very important questions. And it does matter how fast a virus can travel from one side of the world to another. And it does matter how fast information can fly across the globe. But with that global perspective, we can't lose the mission. We can't lose the meaningfulness of local activity. Because at some point, we are still local beings. Now, I may have put you in three different time uh, experiences. And I may have connected you in very odd and interesting ways. But nevertheless, as human beings and as communities, we define our actions within some sense of local. And we need to understand how global connectivity can still be harnessed for the power of individuals and for the power of the local. So thank you for your time. Uh, this is my fun part of the forum. Um, I also get to have the, uh, the advantage of being the host, which is to say we're not going to go into questions. Uh, right now, but I hope to talk with you over great food and drinks at the reception and throughout the rest of the forum. But more importantly, I hope I've posed some questions that have left you scratching your head um, and wondering what in the world best been thinking um, and uh, provide uh, fodder for conversation throughout the rest of the, the forum. So thank you very much. And I think I am turning it over to Lori and Shiva, who are going to tell you about that great convergence competition that I gave you a preview of. Don't leave quite yet. <laughs> so thanks for, for um, oh. all right, we're just getting our housekeeping in order. Um, so quick question for folks in here. Beth talked about uh, the CIC Convergence Innovation Competition. How many of you have heard of that before, either by the acronym or name? Good. So that's, I'm saying good. You'll, many more will know shortly. Um, there, um, but anyway, that's where we're going to start off. So, Shiva, tell me, what is CIC? Oh, we're sharing this. I couldn't, I couldn't get that. Uh, thanks, Laurie. Uh, well, CIC, which stands, it's short for Convergence Innovation Competition. It's uh, our Georgia Tech's premier student innovation competition. We are in the ninth year uh, running. Uh, it's produced by uh, GTR NAC, which is... Uh, a research group that's part of IPAD. Some would say the research group in IPAD. Uh, but who am I to? So we, we are in the eighth year of running uh, under the auspices of uh, the CTO's office, led by Ron Hutchins here. Um, it brings together industry partners, uh, community partners, and research faculty, and uh, all the academic uh, initiatives here at Georgia Tech uh, to bring together uh, folks to foster innovation amongst the student community. It is open to the entire student community here at uh, Georgia Tech, regardless of class or uh, major, and usually our multidisciplinary teams tend to do the best. And, oh, sorry. We just wrapped up our 10th uh, edition. Uh, I know 8th or 10th edition, we do one in the spring and one in the fall. Uh, the fall competition is uh, sponsored by the President's Office here at Georgia Tech and focuses on uh, campus initiatives and campus applications and services. Uh, the wonderful Marcom team here at iPad have put together a, a, a video that captures the essence of the competition that we just wrapped up last week. Ed. CIC is a semester-long competition. So all throughout the semesters, we have multiple, multiple ways for students to come engage with us. Students can come and have feedback given to them on their projects and have um, 
and can uh, escalate the project completion. There you go. The projects in the CIC and in GT, in GT Journey at large uh, span a wide variety of areas. The seat me, she can identify the best available seat to suit her needs as a student. Or it can help you on campus, some, something similar to building augmented reality campus tours. Or it can also help you build more secure ways to navigate as you go from campus back to the surrounding community. All you need to do is enter your destination and the time you wish to leave and GT Walkmate will work out the best walking companions for you so that you don't have to walk back home. I've been a part of it several times and we've done like a few together. Definitely. I think it's grown every year. So it's it's been it's been great trying to um, create different idea, and ideas and projects every semester and be able to flush it out. MentorWeb is a streamlined platform that enables informed mentor matching between incoming students and upperclassmen. It's proven to be a really good um, portfolio piece to talk about. So that's like another thing that we try to explain to students that we create this environment for you to develop your ideas and it's all and you, you come away with this really cool like resume builder and project that you get to share with people outside of school once you leave. judges from across campus and our partners uh, to come uh, judge the event. They'll all be numbered and you just kind of match the number to the project. Um, all the entries are required to provide a live demonstration of the projects uh, and to explain the motivation and as well as how they went about solving the issue. When you're coming into a college, college environment, you kind of want some kind of guidance. So we wanted to help create that experience for future freshmen. Not only are they great new applications, but they're well thought out. And a lot of them already have, a, have it set up. They've already beta tested it. I think the reaction of the um, some of the sponsors accentuates that they're seeing value in the competition as well. First of all, you're all winners, because I didn't see anything that wasn't very interesting out there. And, and the time and effort you all put into it is just incredible. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. The first place winner is Tasket. It has truly been an eye-opening experience for me personally in that you see everyday problems being reimagined. Students tend to think much more innovatively and inventively to address everyday problems. And just the energy of students working together is always a very um, fulfilling experience to go through. We have anywhere between 150 to 300 students participate. Uh, the fall competitions tends to be a little bit smaller, about 150 students, and the spring competition is a little bit bigger, uh, more uh, wider uh, reaching, and so we tend to have about 200 to 250 to maybe even up to 300. So we we're seeing here, what you saw in the video, was the fall competition was all around campus life, um, but you alluded to a spring competition and that it's much bigger. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what's the difference between the two? Sure. Uh, so the spring competition is very unique in that it's fully industry funded and sponsored. Uh, so this, we work with our uh, industry partners to uh, we work with our industry partners to uh, define uh, focus areas or categories uh, so that students are directed in where to innovate into. So what this allows sponsors to do is bring in their technologies, their research interests into the competition and open up their data or their platforms for students to innovate against. So it's a it's a industry focus, industry defined student innovation in the spring. 
What, what are some of the kind of categories you've had in the past? So the last couple of years, uh, tying into the theme of the forum this year, uh, we've been looking at the connectedness of everyday life. So we've been looking at uh, innovation in the car, uh, in the home, and the workplace, and you know, general convergence of technology in everyday life. Great. Um, looking towards this spring, um, anything, any um, hints you can have on what's coming up? Sure. Uh, I'm happy to announce that our first full category sponsor for spring is going to be Verizon Wireless. And uh, with Ver thank you. <laughs> uh, so we'll be working with Verizon uh, and their automotive division to uh, look at uh, services and applications in the car. Uh, and we're very excited because this is going to be part of a wider ranging engagement with, between Verizon and Georgia Tech. That's great news, great news. Yeah. Um, we're still looking for, for more. We, ha we have some others lined up we'll announce yeah. later. But um, did want to let folks know that for corporations, certainly sponsors get deeply involved with the students throughout the semester. It's a great way to look at talent and to also look at the great ideas. For those who may not be representing sponsor companies, um, there's still ways to, to get engaged, not quite as deeply. Uh, but that really comes around to giving input and, and feedback to the students at the demo days such as tomorrow. So we encourage you to stop by, check them out, uh, really run them through the ringer, find out what they've been doing and why they did it and what, where it might go, encourage them. And then we uh, do our demo day several times a year, so please keep coming back. Uh, with that, I think we are going to hand it off to Beth and then the fun stuff. Thank you, thank you. Nope, I, got, I, I am mic'd for days. Thank you. All right. Um, I think I have reviewed enough of uh, the themes. Uh, tomorrow morning we will start here at what time, Allison? 8.30 tomorrow morning. Um, we will uh, have some industry partner spotlights again. Uh, we're going to have a terrific plenary address by Dr. Bill Stead. And we're, then we will uh, follow it with a, uh, another industry panel around the future of healthcare. Um, our lunch tomorrow is, uh, for those of you wondering why you might have a number on the back of your badge, don't lose that because we are doing some social connectivity experiments, but we're being explicit about it. Um, uh, and it feels like wedding planning, but we've done uh, some table assignments to try to provoke some interesting conversation. So don't lose that badge and number because uh, that is uh, where your food is going to be and where your uh, interesting conversation is going to be. If you don't have a number, you're a free agent in this experiment, um, and there will be uh, ample opportunities to join the conversation. Um, in the afternoon, again, we're going to focus on the future of driving, the future of the automotive experience, um, and again, a keynote by Jeff Letty uh, from Verizon, and then a, a fantastic panel, again, of Georgia Tech Research and Industry Partners. We will close the day with uh, the demo showcase, which will be over in the Technology Square Research Building, where well, there will be at about 100 to 200 some research demos. We promise more than you can consume uh, within that hour and a half, two hour period. And then we will end with a reception. But for today, I want to thank you for being here, for participating. I want to thank all of our wonderful speakers and moderators um, and questions and engagement from the audience. Um, you are all invited to go right across the street to our VIP, which means the food's really good, um, to our VIP uh, reception and showcase. Um, and in case some of you are thinking about, oh, I really need to get home, I've got work to do, um, I do have to announce that I'm not sure which President Bush, I guess the W, President Bush is next door, um, which means there's no car getting anywhere anytime soon out of this campus. So apparently there's a fundraiser at the hotel. So wait it out. Uh, if you weren't coming anyway, come across the street. Uh, what was it? Food, wine, snacks, and wearables? That's what we've got. <laughs> Um, so we have food and wine and snacks and beer, um, and we have an amazing uh, exhibition on the history of wearable computing, which is in the iPad headquarters right now. This exhibition has been in Canada, multiple places in Germany and China, toured worldwide. Um, it is a fantastic exhibition, and this is your one chance to have it all to yourself. So thank you for a wonderful day one, and I will see you right across the street.